So hello everyone and um, welcome uh, to the latest uh, Foreman community demo. Um, if you're watching the recording on YouTube, uh, please up the screen quality because it might be difficult to view some of the demos otherwise. Um, if you have any, um, hold on, oh no, didn't start. If you have any um, questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to us on Freenode IRC at the Foreman or on Twitter uh, at the Foreman Project. So um, we have a few announcements before we begin. Um, this uh, this next week we have um, the Red Hat Summit, uh, and for the first time ever, it's a virtual event. So while in the past it might have been difficult uh, to justify attending. You are now free to attend all events for free, so please uh, have, a, have a look and sign up to anything that might interest you. And since our last demo, we've had the uh, monumental release of uh, Foreman 2.0, and that saw the, you know, up to over 300 bug fixes and new releases included, so uh, please check out the release announcement for that. And we've also had uh, Catello um, 3.15 has been released. So all information about that can be found on the release announcements in the Foreman uh, community uh, discourse. Um, so uh, today we're going to have um, three speakers. Uh, we have an uh, update on the Pulp3 migration from Justin Sherrill. We also have um, Samir uh, Ja, I hope I'm saying it right, enforcing uh, selected organizations on Catello resources. And then finally, we're going to have a kickoff of discussions about uh, RFCs on the installer certs and Catello on Foreman. So over the last few weeks, Eric has um, Eric and other members of the Catello team have been posting some suggestions. So this is going to uh, kick off wider discussions in the community. There will be some live events, and um, if you're interested in that, we are going to have a sign up in the next few weeks. So please get in touch. So now I'm going to hand you over to Justin to begin. I'm going to stop sharing. All right. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Okay. Should be showing up now. Um, so with the 315 release that was released on Wednesday, uh, Pulp 3 is now included for this initial release. Pulp 2 and Pulp 3 actually live side by side, serving different types of content. So if you install a Pulp 3, or sorry, if you install a Catello 315, you will have Pulp 3 serving file and Docker content, and Pulp 2 serving everything else, essentially. Generally, you, would, you won't notice any sort of difference in the usage of the application. Um, here I've created a repository, a file repository, and it is uh, in Pulp 3. I can... Um, Upload, fi upload files to it, sync, sync it if it had a URL configured as I normally would. The one way to know uh, what's using Pulp 2 and Pulp 3 is by looking at your Smart Proxy on the Services tab. And you'll see here the supported content types under uh, Pulp Core, which is the new Smart Proxy feature indicating Pulp 3 support. We use the term Pulp Core because that's actually what Pulp 3 calls their sort of base software, Pulp Core, with all the plugins um, actually adding functionality to it. So this is a fresh install where Docker and File are enabled uh, in Pulp 3. If you're upgrading from 3.14, make sure to read the upgrade instructions carefully. The uh, at the end of the upgrade, you'll actually still be using Pulp 2 for everything. Um, and you can continue to run 315 that way. If you're in interested in migrating the content to Pulp 3 and switching over to it for File and Docker, there's a separate pr procedure to do that. And so you can do that after you upgrade at any point in time. You can wait till 316, but I would encourage you to at least uh, run the, the initial preparation part of the migration um, and give us feedback on any errors uh, that it won't actually switch over to Pulp 3 and it should be or it's very safe to run even online. Uh, so I would encourage you to do that if you're upgrading to 3.15 just to give us feedback and help us to improve the migration process. Uh, in the 
upcoming releases, we'll be switching Yum and uh, hopefully Debian over from Pulp 2 to Pulp 3 and migrating all that content in the process. And then in the release after that, we will be dropping Pulp 2 entirely. Um, and so with that, you'll, you'll have all the services running on a single database. Um, you, we hopefully will have some performance improvements. We already have seen that in Content View Publishing, some performance improvements there uh, and a whole slew of other things. If there are any questions, just uh, feel free to send an email to the discourse or on IRC. Thank you. So up next we have uh, Samir, if you'd like to start. Hey, thanks, Ben. Let's share my screen. All right, uh, can you see my screen okay? Yep, yeah, perfect, thank you. So, uh, yeah, recently we introduced a change in Ketelo where we changed the, the behavior of this organization selector and how it works with the Ketelo pages slightly. So earlier what used to happen is, for example, we have a dev product here, which belongs to the default organization. But earlier, if you would switch to a different organization, you would still be able to fetch the details of this product and similarly other Ketelo resources. But we are now restricting it based on the selected organization on the UI. So now you'll mm. not be able to load the record. And this is at the API level, so you might also not be able to fetch the record if you pass the incorrect uh, organization ID through the API. So yeah, that's about it for this. Reach out to me if you see any issues around this or if you're using this. Thank you, Samir. So, Justin, uh, not Justin, but Eric, um, it's it's over to you now for for however long you'd like. Got a sound check now. Perfect. All right, so. I have been opening a, I have opened a, a series of uh, RFCs over the past couple of weeks, um, and they are targeted a lot at uh, installation experience and in some ways you could argue uh, part of our overall platform that runs, uh, Foreman runs under. Um, <clears throat> these RFCs are the output of some discussions that uh, started within a smaller group of developers just to sort of set the stage for them. Um, I consider me sort of the, the messenger, messenger and organizer, um, but um, these are the output of conversations that started with myself, Ewood, Suresh, and William. Um, and uh, we started that with that group in part because uh, that is unaware that is working and focusing on what at least we're calling sort of the platform aspect of Foreman um, because it, there's many parts to that from the architecture to installation experience um, to, you know, certificates and all the parts that go into that that uh, we need some slightly overused term to try and encompass what all that is. Um, uh, and then we wanted to bring our discussions to the community for feedback, refine them, and then be able to take some action on them. So my goal here today is to bring awareness to them, bring in uh, some introduction to each of the RFCs and some of the uh, higher level points within each one. Um, and then we would like to continue to see discussion on discourse 
uh, for each of the RFCs um, because not every point has a solution and uh, need to refine the solutions. We would like to try and accompany that with some uh, live in-person discussions um, to allow us to arrive at design decisions for each of them and so that we can then, like I said, uh, start to move forward and take action on these. Um, and, and that's difficult because uh, uh, some of these are things that have been with us for many, many years. Some of them will be interwoven between multiple changes. Um, and, um, you know, we'll need to get started on them sooner rather than later, but with balancing the right amount of discussion and, and what we want for the community. So, um, Feel free if you are on the call to ask questions as we go. I will try to keep the pace moving to try to at least get through introducing all of them. Um, and then, again, if you're watching the recording, please, uh, there will be links to these RFCs. Please post replies, questions on the RFCs that apply to your particular questions. Um, so the first one is technically not an RFC in the sense that it is not labeled as an RFC and it's not in the RFC category. And that is because it is a bit higher level with respect to the ideas within it. And then there are some branched out RFCs that are more uh, specific in, their, in what they're targeting. Um, so the first one here is titled Installation Experience Design. It is not called uh, changes to our installer per se or anything. It is it is trying to focus on the overall this is the experience of our installation more than it is the actual uh, technology necessarily underlying it. Uh, even though some of this will be you know technical and specific to the way the installer works today, it's it's really we're trying to look at the discussion from a experience perspective and make the right choices based on where we're at with our tech. <clears throat> um, so uh, again, I'll try to go over, I'm gonna try to cover every point from a high level, move along unless there are questions, try to give the reason for each of them. So the first one is that we have, uh, historically put the ins the answers file that people that, that, that folks that use the installer used to into um, you know uh, Etsy on this file system which means that we are indicating to users in theory that they should be editing the answers file directly uh, or they, they could edit the answers file directly and then we have a slew of parameters um, <clears throat> while this, think was maybe true in the early days nowadays there are lots of there are things that we're doing inside the hooks there's pre-processing um, <clears throat> that can happen within the installer that can modify the answers file um, and the eventual output of the answers file that simply making changes to it doesn't guarantee that the changes that you want will be propagated or necessarily validated in the right ways um, <clears throat> Um, and so the proposal we're looking at is to move the answers file more to a location and communicating that they sh should be thought of as more like, I say, a database. And I say a database because we are, we, we, you can think of it as there are transactions that happen on the answers file, uh, right? There are um, input parameters to the installer. Those input parameters are validated. They might be modified in some way and then they are written to disk written to the answers file so think of it like transaction you're committing it to disk and now the answers file is the source of truth for the current state of configuration through the installer um, and so that is why we're proposing to move it to do it more like a database but we recognize that it, it can be nice to be able to combine a bunch of configuration options into a file that is that, that you um, then pass to the installer so that you can manage the set of config options you want as essentially as configuration as code uh, or it might be so many options that just crafting this giant installer parameter you know parameterized installer command through um, other tools 
it can be a little bit painful. Um, so we want to, as part of that, keep a method where you can supply a set of answers, a set of options to the installer through a file, but that is not the answers file itself. The answers file itself would be treated like the source of truth. It should not be hand edited. <clears throat> The, another aspect of that, uh, or actually, I guess it's the next, the, the next point down, but that's, I think that encompasses the idea behind why we would like to make this change overall to the answers file. And it will affect some users <clears throat> who have come to write automation and rely on editing the answers file. But we, again, would try to provide a method to give input, uh, still give input to the installer through a file. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that moves us down into. Um, if I can quickly thing. interject there, um, sure. uh, it was definitely never really intended to be modified by people. Um, at least as a long-term installer maintainer, it was always sort of the thought of as the installer modifies the file, and this is communicating to the user. This is not some file that you should edit. It's more of a sort of internal state file. That's probably the summary of the change. Um, there are some questions, will it still be YAML? That's probably, uh, will, will remain YAML because it's just easier for us. But we don't make any guarantees about that. It's really something that the installer has and you shouldn't look at this as something you as a admin edit. Thanks. Um, and I, I will try to monitor uh, or look at questions that if you want to post them as I go, but uh, feel free. Um, I won't necessarily pause between sections to ask if there are questions. So if you have one, just raise it in chat and I'll get to it. Uh, or did you hear me moving to the next one, interject a uh, question, but I feel like chat might be easier. Um, so uh, that leads us into kind of uh, the second one, which is related to the idea answers and configuration file. Um, the idea is to reduce this down to a single answers and config file per installation. Um, you could, another way you could kind of think about this is slightly putting an end to uh, scenario, depending on how you look at scenarios. But if historically the idea with scenarios was added um, to the installer and to date up, uh, there are uh, three Define scenarios within the installer code base itself, and that hasn't really changed uh, over time. Um, functionality when scenarios were implemented was added to allow you to switch between scenarios, uh, except that this was a bit of a forced switching between scenarios. Um, it was not a um, sort of added, additive process where you were including an additional set of configuration. Um, you were wholly switching um, and that was driven, I think, a lot in part uh, due to the difference between Foreman and Catello's installations, um, which um, hopefully time permitting, I, that they're, they're one of the three RFCs if you, is all about adding Catello to a form, to, to a form and it's, it's uh, all about finally getting rid of and addressing the final gaps in the ability to just add Catello to an existing Foreman. So get there. Um, but the idea with this is since we really only ever have one installation um, and then it is additional configuration on top of that, that we would just get rid of this idea of having a hello dash answers, foreman dash answers, foreman.yaml, uh, catello.yaml, uh, that we would uh, also log files that would stop being catello.log and foreman.log or scenario. You know, whatever, insert scenario.here.log. And instead, you would have a single answers file, single config file, and again, that answers file would be treated like a database. You know, it would be a, not something the user should edit. Um, and then the logs would, would also get this update, so you would just have an installer log, and then there would be, um, uh, I get the next one kind of breaks into this more, but you could think of then we also can have a dedicated error log. And it's the same no matter where you're looking, no matter what your install is, uh, it brings cohesiveness to the installs, whether it's a server, Foreman server, or a Foreman with Catello, or a Foreman with uh, 
any other plugin or it's a smart proxy installation with any number of features. Um, <clears throat> no matter what type of system it is that you have installed to, uh, it's the same place to look for what the current configuration is, what the current uh, parameters and answers are, what the current log file is displaying, what the current, if there are any errors, um, is displaying. Um, and this sort of moves us again out of this idea of scenarios, and we've been discussing that a lot of do scenarios, you know, do they still add value and what is that value? Or is it more that we should have a model where you're installing some sort of, uh, you know, base install and everything is just an additive additional set of configuration that you can pass um, via an input file that turns on more features that you want on top of whatever that base installation is. Uh, anything you wanted to add you would there? I think I got it all, but. Um, maybe it would be useful to s the vanilla format without any Catello has always been just one single scenario. So that's sort of the experience that most users have had. But in the Catello scenario, you have three scenarios present and um, that's slightly different experience. So we would probably make sure you can get closer to the vanilla form experience where it's just one scenario. Um, and something we've been talking about is we will have something like a form installer base package and then any particular package that has the scenario that you actually use. And it might conflict with the others. There's some details we need to work out. Those are some things we're thinking about. Is it, uh, you know, uh, what, just to add to onto this, the things that we've been talking about is, you know, when you, uh, I think if you, like if we boil it down, there's really two types of installations, right? There, there's installing form in the server, and then there's installing and adding additional uh, external smart proxies that are managing some set of services. Um, and every, and then the functionality that's added in addition to those two things uh, varies per user need, you, uh, the user needs or that particular plugin that you want to uh, enables needs that that set of functionality, um, and that is you know can be collected kind of that's what the scenario in theory was all, uh, originally designed to use to collect up for that particular item that plugin what are the things that need to be configured what needs what would need to be configured if it was a form and server uh, or an external smart proxy that's managing. Um, the set of services may be needed by that plugin or just needed for your base level, you know, form and install itself. Um, and so kind of trying to reduce it down to those are your two things that you really care about installing is server and any number of smart proxies and then adding functionality and features to. Yeah, and that's where we disagree on opinions. I always see a scenario as a base where you start. Um, and some scenarios I, I was thinking about is you might have a sort of form all in one where you have a form, a form proxy and all the other services. Um, and in the future, I would also like to think of as a base experience where you have just a form, no form proxy, no other services. And that would help be useful in, for example, if you have a local balance setup or those kind of things. Um, but I, I think multiple scenarios still make sense, but switching back and forth between them, I think that this just too complicated. Right. Um, next thing there, uh, which is kind of mentioned around if we reduce it to, to a single known state is error logging. Um, we've no, you know, we've, I think we've seen over the years that error logging and error reporting in the installer uh, and require more work than it we feel like it should try and figure out why something in particular failed where its traceback is what the actual pertinent part of the traceback when it reports an error is um, so this is really around increasing uh, the out uh, making that error handling better making it more concrete as in you should be able to read an error see the logging and be able to take some sort of 
concrete action to figure, to, to address the issue. Um, one of these is that, uh, or just some of the highlighted points that we thought about is um, top one there. We, we actually don't all show progress reporting at all stages of the install. There's a few you don't early hooks. I mean, I really got updates for you, so. Hey, Brad, you're not muted. Um, so showing progress for all stages, there's a couple hooks early on where this, it'll look like the installer's just sitting there doing nothing where we're not reporting output yet. Um, addressing the, I think, most reported issue, which is when the smart, when smart proxy registration fails, um, it can indicate a variety of issues. Um, but it's unclear and it just gets reported as smart proxy failed to register, but it could have been an issue previously. Further up in the installation log, it could have been an error on form in itself, so it's showing up in the production log. It could actually be an error with the smart proxy and show up in the smart proxies log um, or somewhere else uh, entirely, but it, that's something that it, uh, is affected by that, that handshake between proxy and foreman. Uh, so making that error reporting easier to take an action on. Um, cleaning up the error reporting when the installer reports an error, um, whether it's in hooks or puppet apply, uh, sometimes if you don't use verbose, the out error output is just a giant traceback with no indicator and you still have to go look into the log um, and you shouldn't have to necessarily go look in the log. Today we do, we default to debug logging so you get even more output than you should. Um, which means we're masking some of this need to do this. So we should default to just info logging um, uh, or some other uh, level. And then uh, mentioned previously, have a dedicated error log. So you just have one place to go look and check and see if see what the errors were. Um, and then try if we can to get rid of some catch-all error messages so that they're, again, more specific, more actionable. When users hit them, it's easier for them to report it. It's easier for uh, them to take action and find the resolution to the issue. <clears throat> um, I'll kind of go through the next ones a little quickly so I can move on to the next step because I think the Catello Informant is a very interesting one. Um, but uh, then we had some ideas around, hey, we could start to do grouping of parameters. We do this in a simple way today in the installer by having advanced parameters and basic parameters. Uh, the advanced parameters are what require you to have to pass dash dash full helps. They allow us to hide some parameters from the basic output and not overwhelm a user. Um, we could continue to do this, move more things into the advanced group, but we can also introduce other grouping of parameters. So it's a little more clear, like here's the set of parameters that I can use to manage uh, my Postgres configuration or my public configuration or, uh, you know, any number of things that we could think of, we can group them together to make it easier to manage them. And also it allows us to introduce high level parameters for enabling a feature. So having a single flag to enable a feature and that single flag can more easily then configure all the right set of group parameters for the user without them having to know all nine things they have to pass just to get something to properly get wired up. Um, and for next grouping, is I also, for grouping, I also wanted to say that um, the interactive installer already recognizes groups. So if you use form installer dash interactive, then you can already see set up advanced parameters, those kind of things. And we would do that much more than Um, the next one there is around drop dash dash no enable. Uh, this already generated a little bit of discussion, so it could vary in how it looks, but really it's the, right now the installer presents this enable and no enable I option uh, sort of uh, as a blanket across every possible thing. And it doesn't necessarily work in all cases like 
just because it's presented, it, it, it indicates the user they could turn something off, but not everything that's available can actually be turned off. Example is most every plugin, um, once it's enabled, uh, there's not really a way to disable it and providing that as an option to the user um, just presents sort of confusion and false hope as to what they could do. Um, uh, discussion already around this was around that there are some things that actually do make sense to not innate, to have this flag and some that don't. So adding, looking at how we can provide that functionality for modules and features that where, where it has the actual ability to turn it off after the fact. Um, there's a note here about testing. Uh, I won't go into the details, just be aware that like, as part of this, we are really, we are talking also about how to increase the amount of testing that the installation installer itself and the experience are getting uh, at different stages so that we can catch errors earlier, uh, that we can test more scenarios, more situations uh, to ensure they work together and uh, provide uh, more guarantees and <clears throat> stability to, the, to our users as well as make um, development easier, faster, able to iterate on things more, catch errors earlier um, in the process rather than uh, maybe having to wait multiple, multiple hours to be able to figure out did some change break things. Um, so there's a laundry list of things there. I'll just let readers at home read through them. Um, then uh, there's one around uh, DHCP and DNS uh, implementations, which might be a slight, I probably should reword this based on uh, what told me, which is this is really about the fact that we are, conf you can configure BART proxies settings related to a feature like DNS or DHCP. Uh, and then there's also op options to configure those actual services themselves. And uh, today those kind of things are, are very muddled together in terms of what you're configuring when you configure it. And this is all about uh, splitting that out so it's more obvious that when you are using an option, are you configuring the thing itself? Like are you configuring DNS itself or are you configuring the smart proxies DNS options, or how it manages that particular. I'd like to add a comment to that, um, and uh, I think we should seriously consider if we should be in the business of configuring some of the services that aren't required for Foreman to actually run. Just taking a note, I think that would be a good thing to raise either here or as a separate thread. It's further discussion, but I think that's a, a good question. Um, all right, and the last one in here is uh, around Foreman Maintain's role in the installer workflows and I think you could even say our overall community. Um, it was introduced a few years ago and uh, started as providing upgrade support for the uh, satellite distribution of, of Foreman and over time we have moved more functionality into it for maintaining your, your server um, things like backup and restore, um, aggregating service management due to the fact that the plugins can provide services and at any one time it's hard to know what all services you may need to actually stop or only start in some cases. Um, and this has been nice in some cases because move these scripts and things out of things like the packaging repository um, but it is also a place for and maintain this spot where it's used in some cases. Um, it also has this sort of chicken and egg relationship where it can be the thing that's, that manages your upgrade, runs your upgrade, but then it calls part of that upgrade. It's calling the installer, then the installer is calling back in the form and maintain for services. And um, you got this loop of the two calling each other 
And um, I think if you look through our manuals and stuff, uh, you don't necessarily see form and maintain as the uh, entry tool for uh, all of these particular items that it does or the upgrade scenario. Um, so there's some work there to figure out, like, and really elevate it to what its role is and where it should be used, update the docs, present it better to the community, I think, about what it, how it should be used, um, get it more widely used, so package it for, for our Debian installs, so it's central as the uh, installer, um, and digging into, you know, like I said, kind of really what is its role, where does it stand, and, and how does it not play this kind of role where it's not clear or where it's exactly being used in, uh, across the board and what functionality lives there. Um, I think that is probably could be its own separate discussion, but we think about it here because the installer is, is using maintain and then there's the whole upgrade experience that is can be driven through maintain. It needs some updates to handle the full upstream, um, but you know, setting a uh, setting up and knowing where where the installer and installation experience part is uh, versus the upgrade experience because um, the two do go hand in hand, but we can draw kind of a boundary between the two. Um, all right, so uh, looks like you have about fifteen minutes left. Um, so again, that is. The kind of kickoff intro to the installation experience design, there are specific things to the installer, some bigger ideas. Some of the things related to this is split off into this Catello, adding Catello to a form and install RFC. So that's the one I would like to do uh, next uh, because they kind of go in steps together. They're not, it's not like we have to solve the installation experience, but that brings up, um, pushes changes to, uh, Things like to achieve single answers file potentially or uh, some of that related things, we should address the Catello, being able to add Catello to a foreman because it makes some of the designs in the installer and in that experience easier if, if you can just do this, um, like you can do it with other plugins. Um, the first item there is certificate handling. Uh, I if we have time, I will get into that. Otherwise, we'll do a dedicated talk about certificate handling. The certificate handling uh, is now uh, more, I guess, not just related to Catello as a, as a situation, but it plays into the uh, puppet work uh, to extract a puppet to a plug-in. Um, the changes there to be able to have certificate handling that is not um, tied unless a user wants it to be tied. Sorry, uh, to uh, puppet certificate handling. Um, so, uh, there, like I said, there's a dedicated RFC to how we want to do that within the overall overall form, and but that is a big requirement for this because form by default uses puppet CA, Catello by default uses a self-signed CA that it generates um, for giving to Candlepin for it to be able to create client certs, but then also for all of the infrastructure to, uh, to, to be able to talk to each other, whether that's uh, candle pin or pulp or clients or uh, those services running on an external smart proxy. Um, so yeah, please go there. And if I get five minutes at the end, I'll try and cover just some of the general ideas from that. Um, the next one on the list is nested organizations. Hello does not support nested organizations. It disables them, but it you know throws an error today if you try and enable them or use them. Um, the biggest reason for this is the way that Catello maps a foreman organization to a candle pin organization for importing and managing uh, subscriptions and then client registrations. Um, <clears throat> Slightly related is the idea that Catello locks its object scoping to a single org. Um, you can't share a repo across multiple organizations, um, and that ties back into that candle pin model. And so disabling nested orgs has always been the easiest solution for this. I haven't had to just deal with what does it mean to have an organization that's nested within another org. Um, but 
There are users who have nested orgs today, regular format installs. If they wanted to add Catella, we have we need some sort of, you know, we need a solution for those users to be able to add it. Um, and so the three options that I have listed here are from a few conversations that I've had with, with folks. So they're not the only three options, um, but they're the ones that I've kind of gleaned from talking to a few folks. Um, have a marking an organization, being able to toggle it and say, this is a subscription organization, uh, and therefore it enables only some of the operations on that, and that only a root organization can be tied to a candle pen org or be a subscription organization. There, and that would allow having nested organizations that within the way they work within regular, you know, vanilla foreman, but without having to worry about what happens, start trying to import manifest and do all this stuff through a sub org. Um, number two would be just dropping nested organizations together. It's a slightly bigger change and if users are relying on that, you know, there's implications there. The last option is allowing any organization to import a manifest, um, but scope the subscriptions only to that organizations. So sub orgs couldn't see parent subscriptions, for example, they would only see what's at their level, um, exactly at their level. Um, the next one is, uh, it's labeled as conceptual because uh, I think it's, it, it, it's more of how things get thought about and how they get communicated. Um, in, with just Foreman, uh, you have a, if you like, we just scope it down to, to Foreman, even within that ecosystem, things I think are, are just a little bit confusing. And uh, I just wanted to highlight that, which is that we have Smart Proxy, the software, and you also see Smart Proxy in the UI and the API. But then we have this Foreman Proxy RPM uh, and, and within Debian packaging, and it also gets deployed on disk scoped under Foreman Proxy directories and log files and everything related to that. So you end up with like two terms, form and proxy, smart proxy. And if we keep those in mind and then we move to, to the next level, of, I think concept, which is when Catello comes along, whenever you deploy a smart proxy used for Catello's purposes, it comes with certain features, on a, guaranteed to be present in certain sort of ideas of how things should work. Um, the pulp is the most obvious thing. When you deploy, you end up with content. So we ended up creating this form and proxy with content idea um, to try to help indicate and reference what we're talking about when talking to users or each other, knowing that it is a proxy, but it has content features on it, <clears throat> which, could potentially scale out to other things, but it gets a little weird maybe when you think about it. I guess if you're like form and proxy with content and Rex and this and that and that, it becomes a bit of a mouthful <clears throat> to possibly talk about it. Um, but that may be the only way we can actually talk because those features are individual. <clears throat> but if, I, if we move it instead uh, to look at just what concepts come with it, there's also the implication with Catello's uh, bits that you get um, content, you get this idea, uh, you get <clears throat> a focus on isolated isolated communication through the external proxy that all communication is going through it. Um, <clears throat> you are end up trying to talk about a concept that is a higher level than simply the smart proxy itself because the smart proxy can be seen sometimes as the software. So you have to know, are you talking about the software that is the smart proxy and everything that goes with its design? Or are you talking about the greater concept of an external um, <clears throat> server that has a smart proxy deployed on it and is managing a set of services and has a set of hosts uh, associated to it from a, whether it's a registration perspective or potentially from Rex perspective, um, when you get to that like conceptual level, 
think it can be a little harder to talk about. Um, and we would need potentially some reconciliation there to make it easier to add Catello to a form and to understand what that thing is we're talking about. Um, but I don't know that it's specific to Catello. I think it just kind of helps highlight it more. <clears throat> so some of the ideas there were reconcile smart proxy and for, like base levels just reconcile smart proxy and uh, to have a single naming for deploying the smart proxy software and, and dropping foreign proxy to get rid of that layer of, of indirection for defining it um, <clears throat> for, and, and from a code like on system perspective as well, like knowing it is the smart proxy software, it's the smart proxies logs, it's anything that's related to the running of the, the smart proxy software. Um, the other part, I think, it could definitely be trickier, um, and it's that's why I put it here to kind of spark some discussion around it, which is thinking about introducing a concept, a higher level concept and naming convention for that thing to encompass that broader idea of this external piece of software that I have de deployed, connected back to my foreman and is managing a set of services, is related to some set of hosts, um, and naming it something and i you know i just bike shedded a few <clears throat> names out there um my name like node it's very well known what that means it's used in jenkins world and lots of other things capsule from the satellite world uh, site portal from like a construction concept potentially insert other names but i think you know bike shedding the name is can be kind of the either annoying or fun part, depending on who you are. Uh, but the bigger part of that is whether or not we need this bigger concept to be able to communicate what we're talking about or and differentiate from the smart proxy software itself. We're talking about this external thing. <clears throat> um, a few more to go. Uh, Port discrepancy, um, this has been a long-standing one. Uh, we always deploy Candlepin on 8443 in Catello deployments because it is standard uh, Tomcat Java uh, port to deploy to, but it's also a fairly common SSL um, port for other things to deploy to, which is part of why the smart proxy is also deployed to 8443 by default. Um, <clears throat> we have made recently made a change to uh, switch candle pin back to being communicating on local host. So it would be easy for us to, I think, to switch candle point to some other port and start, uh, go back to defaulting to 8443 for the smart proxy in Catello scenarios. And that would align with Foreman scenarios uh, and add, make it easier to add, the t you know, add a Catello onto a Foreman. Um, this is also, we would also have to make the change, which is on the external proxies. <laughs> to switch our Apache reverse proxy for Catello to 443, but that uh, it, there's also really good reasons to do that um, anyway outside of this. So they, that all kind of nicely plays plays nicely together. Um, we had a proposal idea. This one, I guess, is not necessarily a blocker, but it is to elevate the idea, thus the reverse proxy on a form proxy to a smart proxy feature so that you could know you have this, I don't know, for lack of a better term, registration gateway. It's the thing that we've deployed that hosts communicating through. So they're isolating communication through it um, to get uh, both content, but also to register back to, to uh, you know, all the way back to Foreman. Uh, that thing does a number of things and um, Adding as a smart proxy feature could be beneficial in just knowing what is present there, that there is a reverse proxy registration gateway, whatever feature present on that. Um, this last one's a little technical, but it's just basically like within the code, splitting up form proxy content into, move it into Puppet. Uh, Puppet form and proxy, move it into, be handled and treated just like everything all the other plugins, all the other smart proxy stuff, uh, and break this down into more easily manageable blocks uh, and pieces. Um, and then the last little bit here is some changes to help with the 
kind of bringing the scenarios together to breaking down the barriers which in the installer itself, which is merging the hooks directories together, um, getting rid of hooks that are the same, that sound the same, but are slightly different or handled differently, bringing them together. And then also that brings some of some hooks that Cotello had to the form and scenarios as well, uh, that could be useful. Um, and then this idea also of taking, plays into the one answer file, one config file idea, which is kind of merge all the migrations in the installer together. So you really only have ever one set of migrations. You don't have to repeat yourself. And those migrations are smart enough to handle the different scenarios based on what's enabled within the installer. Again, that plays nicely into the whole single answers file on a system idea as there's only one set of migrations modifying those config and answer files over time as we make changes um, to the installer uh, and, and uh, the architecture and everything that lies underneath all of this and feeds into it. Uh, so we got like two minutes left. Uh, that was a lot. I am sure that that is a lot. It was a lot to for us to talk about it, to even write it down. A lot just for me to talk about it. So I'm going to once again encourage, um, please raise questions on the discussions, uh, the RFCs themselves. We will continue to reply, but we will be setting up another idea like this where we can, people can come in person and we can have sort of more back and forth discussion about pieces of these uh, proposals to really to dig into the details or address any concerns to arrive at the best designs and also like I said kind of allow us to move forward because uh, we do want to start working on some of these and I think some are a little more obvious than others so we can start working on those but some require some more community thought and discussion uh, and the big one I didn't touch is certificate handling um, and I would encourage everyone who's not aware to go read the certificate handling discussions. Um, it has a lot in there around whether we have a tool or have a networked option and how that plays into the installation process or handle both, trying to cover all the various needs that people have for our community, but also provide a base level certificate set up for users who just want to jump in and start using things. Um, and with that, Stop with probably like 30 seconds. Thanks, Eric. Um, I think you've you've really earned a glass of water after after all of that. <laughs> Has anyone any final questions before we wrap up? Okay. So um, I will uh, say goodbye with that. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for all the questions. And um, this uh, this is the beginning of of this. So uh, we'll add something else to the calendar soon. Oh, honest.